Praise the Lord. Okay, uh, yeah, that's a good one. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> you know, I, I was working, and somebody said something really good at work when I was working at a restaurant, and I wanted to say praise the Lord. But all of a sudden, I reminded myself, hey, you're not in church. You know, you shouldn't say praise the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit jumped all over me and said, what do you mean? If you want to say praise the Lord, you know, you shouldn't have the fear of man on you. You should say praise the Lord. And so, so then I said, praise the Lord. You know, and they all looked at me funny. But I, because I, it was a little awkward because I kind of missed a, a little beat there, you know, when, when I was so properly supposed to say it. <laughs> I was a little behind, you know. <laughs> but, but praise the Lord. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Everybody say this about your Bible or your electronic device, whatever you're using this morning. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, today we're celebrating motherhood, and motherhood has been under attack for many years. How providential that Mother's Day should occur in the same season that Roe versus Wade is about to be overturned. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, this is a huge victory for motherhood. What would the world be like if mothers lost their natural affection for children? What would the world be like? What kind of world would it be if most mothers... If most women didn't want to raise a family and caring for children became a disdained occupation. And with now, with working mothers, we actually see a, uh, the curve as far as the birth rate has gone down in the United States. And not because of abortion, because most, many women are choosing not to have babies. Right? Or they're waiting so long in, to have babies that they only have one or two. <coughs> Praise the Lord. So our birth rate is down. And some people would say, well, that's a good thing. There's too many people. <laughs> no, it's not. Because when some of you get to be 65 or older, there's not going to be enough children to sustain the Social Security program or a lot of the benefits that you have. Right. So it's not a good thing that we have a population decline. Okay, so with working mothers, tr there's, there's what they call the traditional marriage model, and, and then there's the partnership model. Has anybody ever heard these terms before? No. Well, I know you have, because you're not raising your hand, but I know you have anyway, so, so quit fibbing on me. A traditional model was what my parents had when I was growing up. When I was growing up, uh, my, my dad, he worked, he worked a lot, as a matter of fact, and my mother, she was a house mom. And she, wor she worked very hard, you know, cleaning, doing laundry, making the meals, taking care of us kids, yelling at me, doing some more dishes, yelling at me. Then I would whine about something, then she'd yell at me some more. So she worked really hard, you know. And uh, she actually had this uh, this the spanking thing it was like a little wooden thing and it's I, and it was it was it was in it was in the <laughs> a drawer it was a squeaky drawer and this this spanking thing it had a little deer on it and said spank the little deers or something i don't know <laughs> i don't even remember the saying on it but i remember the deer on it and spanking the deer and i was like whatever and uh and 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 it had a thing to go around your wrist you know some nice handle so you could just really whack that thing get the thing going like this and and uh uh, we'd be we'd be really causing a lot of problems in the living room, you know. And my dad, he worked third shift and he was sleeping, and so you didn't want to wake dad up, you know. So my mother would warn us, you know. You know how the warning goes. And then uh, and then all of a sudden we would hear 
her stuff because there was a there was a, a, a drawer in that everybody got a junk drawer in their house in the kitchen there was a junk drawer in the kitchen the kitchen had that spanking thing in it you know that stick and uh, and all of a sudden you could hear this rack and second and you, you as soon as you heard those footsteps then you hear the squeaky door the you know <laughs> and you hear the fumbling around in there ah, rack and and you're like, oh no. And so we would just beeline for the door. We'd run down the street. But they, they never, we never came home till the lights came on. When the street lights came on, that's when you came home. And you, she would yell, you kids have to come home sometime. You're going to get hungry. And then you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I know some of you don't understand, but some of us were a little bit more challenging to raise than other of you. I mean, you may have like little passive little kids, but some of us were a little bit... But you know, the, the, the real hard ones to raise, I just want to tell you, they're your future leaders. So, so God bless you moms, you know, God bless you moms. Amen? But uh, so tr traditional marriage, my, my, my dad would come home from work, he would sit down, he would sit down in the lazy boy recliner and he'd get his, my mom would get him his newspaper and, and get him his coffee and then she would make dinner and then, and then I was the antenna, you know, dad would say uh, change the channel because they didn't have remotes, you know, and then I had to move around the, <laughs> yeah that's good, stand right there. <laughs> So he could watch the nightly news. Okay, that was his traditional marriage model. And, and chores were very much, this is what mom did, this is what dad did. Everybody with me? But, not, but now you have working mothers, and it just doesn't work that way anymore. You can't, you can't have a working mother come home and then do all of the housework, do all of the cooking, do all of the child rearing, do all of it, plus work. Right? She'll die young. Yeah, it's too much. So now, with, with working mothers, if a family chooses to have a working mother, there's called a partnership model, where now you have to share the household responsibilities. Right? Everybody with me, dads? Yeah, parent and future dads. So just be prepared. You know, uh, like Nicole and I, we share, we share the cooking responsibilities, we share the, you know, the dishwashing responsibilities, share all the responsibilities that, that goes on to being home. And uh, praise the Lord. Everybody good with that? You ha if you're going to survive these days, you have to uh, figure out who's, what roles each of you are going to play and what you're going to do in the household. I'm telling you, you've got to have a partnership role model and you've got to figure this out. Because uh, if you want your wife to work, husbands, so you can pay for your big truck, <laughs> you're going to have to do some stuff. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Okay. So let's, uh, let's keep going. So I'm glad that blessed you. How did I do, moms? Did I help you out? Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully I helped you, helped you out with that one. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm just going to really quickly, I just want to show you... Three, three women, and this first one, her name is uh, Deborah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to you go to Judges chapter 4 for this one. And this was an exceptional woman. And there are three different, I'm, I'm going to give you three different types of women here in the Bible, because one size doesn't fit all. But this, this woman was exceptional in, the, exceptional in the fact that she was a mighty leader and, uh, and, and a prayer warrior. This woman was a prophetess. She was a judge. She was a songwriter, a worship leader, and a mother. So this woman did it all. And, and uh, this is an example of, of the fact that, you know, some of God's best men are women. Yeah, and that God does not, he does not hold down women in the church. If you come to our church, I know I'm a senior pastor, but we have women leadership in practically every department. I mean, there's women worship leaders, there's uh, women over the everything. Pretty much, I, you know, because they're smarter than me, so I surround myself with some... Okay, how did I do on that one? I do good on that one? Yeah. Okay, keep, keep going. Judges chapter, chapter 4, verse 1. 
It says, when Ehud was dead, Ehud was a mighty leader. And I'll tell you, when, when strong leadership is gone, everybody feels the lack of covering. They feel the lack of the strong leadership. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, Canaan who reigned in Hazar. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Herosheth Hagoyim. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron. And for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of, of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountain of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came to her for judgment. Isn't that good? They came to her for judgment because she was a wise woman and prophetess and strong leadership. And she, she had a prophetic uh, uh, unction to get this Barak to lead this army. And they destroyed the armies. And uh, it was fantastic what God did through her leadership. And, and after her because of her strong leadership, it was, uh, it, it was, it was, it was really beneficial to the whole the whole uh, place of Israel for years until she died. And then once a strong leader was gone, again, there's a void. And if nobody picks up and, and you get weak leadership after that, then things go back to chaos. They go back to a mess. But in the fifth chapter, she said a couple really good things. In the fifth chapter, verses, verse 2, it says, When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. When leaders lead, right? when they take the courage to lead in righteousness and they lead and uh, then people volunteer. Now look at verse 7. I love verse 7. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. So you have today, you see some mothers really arising. You see some mothers really rising up. And when I, when I look at those uh, videos of mothers and there it is, see? Now don't go to sleep. You go to sleep, Mommy. Yeah, with that noise. Okay, so we see mother, you know, I see videos of mothers in school board meetings defending the rights of their children and challenging the school board about curriculum that's, that's terrible. Pornographic and different things that are going on. And I, and I think to myself, go, Mom! Go, Mom! Yeah! Protect your kids, man. Go in there. Charge in there and do something. Why? Because nobody else was doing it. Nobody else was saying anything. Nobody else was putting themselves on the line and going in front of that school board. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. While other people were sitting down, she rose. That's why she, she was leading. Nobody else would do it. Praise God. So I'm so glad because I just, there's a book that was written just a little while ago. And it's called Lioness Arising. And a uh, fantastic book. I can't remember the author right now. Some of you. Lisa Bevere. Yeah, thank you so much. That's the name of it. And it's all about women getting healed and, and taking their place in leadership in the body of Christ and going forward. And I'm, I'm just so glad. You know, Pentecostal movement is, is historically had many powerful women leadership in the Pentecostal church. Traditional churches would hold down women and wouldn't let them in any leadership roles. Where the Pentecostal church has traditionally been free to allow women to achieve anything that they wanted to achieve in the, in the church. Praise the Lord. That's why you'll see, uh, you know, right now you see a lot of women pastors in a lot of denominations, but traditionally that wasn't so. It was the Pentecostal churches that took the leadership and allowed women to lead when they sensed the anointing on them. Praise the Lord. In China, most of the pastors in China are women. You might not have known this. Most of the underground church pastors are women. Praise God. You know, there's something about a patriarchal woman. Now, Whenever a, a woman rises up and she's strong, like a Deborah, there's people go, that's a Jezebel spirit. You know what? It's so stupid. Because to be a Jezebel, first of all, you have to have a controlling spirit. and That's different than leadership, servant leadership. 
And second of all, you have to be leading against the Lord into something false. Right? So just because a woman is a strong woman doesn't make her a Jezebel. Get some discernment. You're going to have to discern between what a strong woman is and what a Jezebel is. Right? Okay, praise the Lord. Somebody say amen. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next one. Let me get my next axe out to grind. No, I'm just kidding you. Uh, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I, I want you to know that a Jezebel spirit doesn't have to just be on women. I've seen some men with a Jezebel spirit too. Apparently it doesn't mind what gender it goes to. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. Uh, I'm not going to expound on that. First Samuel chapter 1. We want to go, now, now this, is, this is woman number 2. Hannah. She was not like Deborah. All she wanted to be was a mom. She had no aspirations for some huge leadership role in society. She wasn't called to do this immense thing. She just wanted to be a mom. You know, I, one time I asked my mother, I said, I said uh, and my mother was born on Mother's Day, by the way. She's passed away. God bless you, Mom. Hope you're listening. <laughs> but uh, put a good word in for me. <laughs> but, you know, my mother, I asked her one time, I said, I said, Mom, do you ever want, what, what's your dream? What's your dream in life? What do you want to do with your life? And she says, I'm living my dream. And I said, well, what is that? She goes, all I wanted to do was be a mom and raise a family. And I'm doing it. That's all I wanted to do. And at first I thought, is there something wrong with that? At first I thought, shouldn't, she, shouldn't everyone have some sort of ambition in life? You know? You're looking at me, but this is the pressure that women are under nowadays. What if a woman's dream is to be a mom? Why isn't that okay? This is all this woman wanted to be. It says, now there was a certain man, uh, Remaeth Zophim, on the mountains of Ephraim, and his, and his name was uh, Elkinah. And it goes into how many fathers he had. And then it goes into verse 2. <laughs> generation and generation. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give double portion, for he loved Hannah. Now note, note this, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Now she did nothing wrong. There was nothing that she did to close the womb. This, the reason why it says this twice, that the Lord closed the womb, is to, is to make a point that there was something providential happening. There was a bigger thing happening here. God was purposely holding back the thing that she wanted the most in life to birth something amazing. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so setbacks can be a setup. And so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she, prov that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. So isn't that the way it is, you know? You know, people like to brag about what they have. So there's some, sometimes I, I get with different pastors and, and I'm talking to them and all they want to talk about is them and what they're doing and what their church is doing. I just want to give you a little hint on conversation. First you share about yourself and then you stop and listen to the other person share about themselves. And it goes back and forth like this. Some people do not even know that art. All they want to do is talk about them and how awesome they are. And after about a half hour of listening to this, you're feeling like a, about this big. You're going, gosh, I guess I'm not doing anything compared to how awesome they are. 
Actually, that doesn't affect me. I just, I don't, it doesn't bother me at all. But some people I could imagine who, who don't have the same kind of hubris that I have, <laughs> it might get to them. Okay, but as we keep going, and then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And, and why is your heart grieved? Am I not better th th to you than ten sons? People mean well when they say, okay, I know that you want to get married. But what you're going to have to do is just deal with the fact that you're single. Embrace your singleness. Enjoy your singleness. And then when you get to the point where you enjoy your singleness, then God will bless you. That is about the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. No, if you feel like God has something for you and it's held back, why shouldn't you believe God and press in for God to answer your prayer? And it being held back might be something providential because God wants to give birth to something amazing. That's just one example of many. There's other things. And so Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting at the, at the seat of the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the, if, the affliction of your maidservant, Remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. Then I will give unto the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. That's a Nazarite vow. And it happened, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. And Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I've poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider you. Now, this is, the, this is another thing, too, is whenever somebody is a little bit emotional, you know, in the presence of the Lord, or, or with, if worship gets a little bit too out there, you know, then people go, well, these people are drunk. <laughs> They're weird, you know. And, and, and because for some reason, it's okay to be emotional at a football game. It's okay to be emotional, you know, pe people uh, uh, at a hip-hop bar. It's okay for people to be crazy at these, all these other venues. But if somebody gets a little exuberant in church, oh, settle down. You're a little too emotional. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I, I, don't, I don't think that's cool. I think it's okay. To laugh, to cry, to shout, to, and sometimes to be still into the presence of the Lord, right? Okay, so Eli said to her, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman wet, went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Her face was no longer sad because she received her prophetic word. She received her answer. Her face was no longer sad, not because, not because she was just settling into the fact that she was never going to have any children for the rest of her life. Right. I just, I'm just going to agree that I'm just going to be impoverished this way for the rest of my life. So now I'm at peace with it. No, she wasn't sad because she had a word from God. When the priest said that, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, she received it as her answer. And miraculously, she got pregnant, and she bore a son and gave him to the Lord in the, the, uh, chapter 2, verses 18 through 20, 21. And the Samuel ministered before the Lord as a child wearing a linen ephod. Moreover, her mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer yearly sacrifice. Verse 20. And Eli would bless Elkanah, his wife, and say, The Lord give you descendants from the woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Now notice, again... Eli's pronouncing something prophetically over the woman. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Don't I'll tell you, patriarchal blessings are huge, people. And so are patriarchal curses. So we have to be careful what we're pronouncing over our offspring. Amen? It says, uh, and, and, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons, two and two daughters. Meanwhile, the, cha the, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. So here, this woman just wanted to be a mother. And you know what? Her contribution was a mighty prophet to the Lord. 
Two books bear his name in the whole Bible. So, when a person says, all I want to be is a mother, I'll tell you, their contribution could be huge in the destiny of an entire nation. And we minimize this? When you read, when you read the book of Kings, it says, and so and so was the king, and his mother was. And so and so was an evil king. And his mother was. <laughs> That's not in there by chance. Praise the Lord. Motherhood is huge. Let's go to this one last story. This is in Luke. Luke chapter 1, 26. So we talked about Deborah. And she was this amazing, mighty woman, this leader, you know, and a mother. And it was because of her motherhood was the source of her willing to rise up and deal with what was going on in society. Her motherhood was not a weakness. It was her strength. And then we have Hannah who just wanted to be a mother. And her motherhood produced something amazing. And now we have this other young gal, Mary, who, who we, we don't really talk about her that much because we're so afraid of being like the Catholics. <laughs> that we don't venerate her enough. She is a hero of faith. She's one of the heroes. And what did she contribute? Motherhood. That's what, that was her big contribution. To just bear a child and raise him in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That was her call. And she's considered the greatest woman in the Bible. Why, why am I preaching like this? Because motherhood is so disdained nowadays. And women have so much pressure to do so many different things, otherwise your value is so small. I, I gotta tell you, when, when did we start despising motherhood th that much? Amen? So in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Wouldn't that freak you out <laughs> if some angel came to you? Now, there's many that believe that she was about 14 at this time, 14, 15 years old, a young teenager. It says, and when, he, and when she saw him, she was troubled, you think, at his saying, and considered what matter of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, God saves, or Savior. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the Lord, How can this thing be since I do not know a man? Now that question was not a question of unbelief. She wasn't saying, Oh, that's, Im that's impossible. I don't, I don't believe how that could happen. No, she was like, You know, I, I know how things work. <laughs> How's this going to happen? <laughs> and the angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God. A miraculous conception was going to happen here. Praise the Lord. Now, now you consider this. This, this woman in, in Matthew's Gospel, it goes a little bit further into the details of all the drama that ensued. So you're talking about a very conservative culture and uh, this woman is pregnant out of wedlock. Yeah. 
pregnant out of wedlock. And, uh, and so you don't think that caused a little bit of drama? Yeah, and, and, and Dave and her, her husband, Joseph, was secretly considering to divorce her privately before, but then he thought, well, if I did that, then it would come out that she's pregnant out of wedlock and they would stone her, possibly stone her, or do, do something else to her. Aren't you glad we don't live in that kind of, kind of condemnation, right? But uh, so this was this was a terrible situation, and she had to endure this. Now, how many people are going to believe you're pregnant out of wedlock, and you're getting all this persecution from the community, and you're and, and how many people are, and you can't tell them that it was a miraculous conception? They they won't believe you anyways. So think of what she went through. This woman was this young woman was was tough. This was a tough woman to be able to endure all this. And then when the census came, she's pregnant and she's riding a donkey all the way <laughs> to Bethlehem as a pregnant, young pregnant woman. Is anybody with me today? Yeah. I could hardly get my wife to walk across the floor when she get, got about nine months pregnant, you know? Okay. Praise the Lord. Now, now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, also has conceived a son in her old age, and now in the sixth month of her who was called barren. So there you go, another barren woman, you know, all of a sudden miraculously conceives. Praise the Lord. Motherhood. The mother of John the Baptist. And it says, uh, For with God, nothing will be impossible. For with God, nothing. Without God, yeah. With God, nothing. Make, God, make sure God is with this. And it will not be impossible. Okay, and Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be so according to your word. And the angel departed from him. She submitted, she yielded to the call of God on her life. Was it easy? Was God calling her to something easy? But she yielded to what God wanted for her life. And we're afraid to, to venerate, or to, not venerate's a bad word, we're afraid to esteem her as a, as a woman of faith. Praise the Lord. Yeah. This is a mighty woman of faith right here. She's not to be worshipped. She was a woman that needed salvation just like anybody else. And I'm sure that she wasn't the perfect mother. How could she be? She was flawed just like the rest of us. <laughs> but you can be a good mother. You can be a great mother. Amen? So let's finish this up. Now Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste to the city of Judah and entered the house of Zachary, uh, Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, now listen to this, that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a really important verse because what that shows is that a child in the womb is a person. And, and could respond to the presence of Jesus in the womb. The spirit, oh, come on, church. Yeah, a person's a person, no matter how small. Yeah, even in the womb. Oh, man, praise God. Yeah, and, uh, and she spoke a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Whew. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her by the Lord. Blessed are you who believe, for there will be a fulfillment of those things that are told you of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you're so good. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for, for moms. Thank you for motherhood. Thank you, Lord, we will not despise mothers or motherhood or housewives or anybody who chooses to take that season of their life to not focus on their career, 
but nor will we despise women who are in leadership, who go forth and do great things in, in the secular world, Lord. But Lord, we, no matter what, we're called to, we're going to celebrate motherhood, and motherhood is a strength, it's not a weakness. It is a blessing, not a curse. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for our moms. Give them strength. Give our mothers strength. And help all those around the moms to be sensitive to their needs and sensitive to when they need a break and when they need help. Thank you for it, Lord. And if you're here today and you want to make Jesus your Lord, just uh, wave your hand at me and I'll ask you to put it down. Is there anybody here that wants to make Jesus their Lord? I'm not talking about a halfway commitment. I'm not talking about, you know, just, just one foot in and one foot out. I'm talking about all in. You want to make this day your all in, where you're not going to be afraid what people think. You're going to make Jesus number one. Because, I'll tell you what, your friends aren't going to stand with you in the judgment. We all stand alone before the Lord to answer for our lives. And Jesus is going to say, why didn't you serve me? And you're going to say, because I wouldn't have been cool to my friends. My friends might, I might have had to get new friends. And How many know that that's going to sound really stupid in front of the angels? Can we be real? Thank you, Jesus. So if you're here today and you want to make Jesus, you want to mess around and play games, you raise your hand. And don't be ashamed of the Lord. Is there anybody here who wants to do that? Let's say a prayer, church, to help those who may want to, might want to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. <laughs> and even those, I know that there's some here, and I know that there's some watching on video that are going to make Jesus their Lord today. Wouldn't this be a great Mother's Day present? Kids coming home to the Lord. Mothers coming home to the Lord. It's just saying, Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me for my sins. Help me to live for you wholeheartedly. I believe that Jesus died for me. For me. So I could be forgiven. And that he rose from the dead so I could have eternal life. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior today. Make me born again. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand up. I'm going to bless you. And these altars are open. And if you need prayer for anything, we're going to linger. And we are willing to agree with you. Next week our prayer teams are going to be started to be scheduled up here. So it's going to be awesome. So we're glad to get that ministry back going. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful church. I thank you, Lord, for this great church. Thank you for the privilege, the privilege of, of, of being able to serve your people and to be a pastor to, to this church. Thank you, Lord, for these wonderful people. Bless them, Lord. Bless their day. Let your face shine upon them and give them peace this day and this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you.